open up our Bibles, let's get after it today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8. We're going to be focusing on verses 26 through 40 today. So Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And as you're doing that, turn to your neighbor uh, or the person behind you or in front of you and say, Jesus looks good on you today. I find it kind of funny that you all said, Jesus looks good on you today, and some of you start laughing. put it up here on the screen to a little bit for you as well. So let's stand as we read God's word. That's what we do to honor his word. We stand to uh, honor it here in Living Water. If you can stand, uh, if not, that's okay. And so we're going to be looking at verses 26 through 40. And so uh, let's go from here. It says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and, and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasure. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and the lamb is silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his hum uh, humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe this generation? Who, for his life, is taken from the earth? The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about himself or someone else? And Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip approached in uh, Azo uh, Azotus, and he said that he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So, Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you, Father, for what you're, you're doing in this place right now and how you're moving in us. Father, we pray, God, that your word can continue to pierce our hearts, God, and transform us. God, the way, the only way that we, you know how. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you open up our eyes so that we can see your word more clearly. We pray, God, that you open up our ears so we can hear your word more clearly. And, Father, we ask that you open up our hearts so we can feel your word more clearly. God, you're so good. We sure do love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So before you sit down, make sure you turn to three people and say, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. <laughs> So my sermon title today is Don't Hesitate. Say don't hesitate. don't hesitate. We're in the middle of our series right now called Taking Back Our Territory. And we've been focusing on uh, a few things that the Lord has put on our heart. We talked about how we need to pray harder. We talked about how we need to focus harder. Last week we talked about how we need to worship harder. And today we're talking about how we need to witness harder. If you look at the word witness, it means this. A person who gives testimony. Another word for witness means testify. I have a question for you. Have you ever had someone come across your mind out of nowhere? Come on, church. Yeah. You ever had somebody, right? Maybe it was a loved one, or maybe it was a, uh, a friend, or maybe it was someone from the past that just 
happens to come from your mind, right? And my question is, is what do you do at that moment? What do you do at that moment when that person comes across your mind? I had a friend of mine, his name is Tim, was Tim. <laughs> I met Tim in high school, Tim was crazy. Uh, he was, and that's why he's a friend of mine. And Tim had this great personality. He got kind of out of control sometimes, but uh, he uh, came over to my parents' house for that time, and my mom asked him to take the laundry downstairs. And Tim is kind of a goofball, so he's carrying the laundry downstairs for my mom, and he pretends to fall down the stairs, right? And he makes this obscene noise, like, oh, jeez, oh, my God, oh, man! And he just falls down there, and now me and my buddies are kind of laughing. My mom is like militant. She just stands there, or she's sitting in her chair, and she doesn't, she doesn't care. She does not care. Right? Like 15 minutes go by. And so we go and look at Tim. Tim did not break character. He laid on the floor for 15 minutes with laundry all over him. He contorted his body and all that stuff. He laid there for 15 minutes. And so we look at him, and we start laughing, and he's like, help. My mom comes around to the top of the stairs, he goes, don't you care for me? She says, you better pick up all that laundry that you dropped. You better put it in the, in, in, in the laundry room. He gets up and he says, okay. He had this crush on this girl who lives out of, out of town, like out in the country. And her parents are gone. He's like, come on, let's go scare her. And I was like, oh, sure, I'm down for that. So we go out there, right, and it's dark. And there's these fence posts that you can see, right? But, and you know how like, you have a and there's barbed wire fence, you know, that goes to the ground, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so, uh, it is cold, man, it is cold. <laughs> and he's wearing shorts. So he goes, come on, let's, let's race across the front here. And I was like, bro, I think there's like barbed wire fence here. He's like, no, 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 I've been here many years. Right, so he comes running, right, and he's got his hands in his pocket, and I let him go first. I figured that if he makes it through the post, there are no barbed wire fence. If he ricocheted back to me, then I'm gonna, I'm not the one who's gonna get hurt. So he's running full speed, and I'm kinda right behind, and sure enough, what do you know? He runs into the barbed wire, ricochets it back, cuts his clothes, he's got barbed wire holes all over him. Now I'm starting to laugh, right? I take him over to my mom's house, or to my, to my house, and I'm showing, <laughs> he's got blood coming all over himself. And he goes, look what happened. I told my mom what happened, and she goes, you're an idiot. Why would you do that? So my mom, raising up in my house, if you cut yourself, you know she used to get the infection out? Alcohol. Hydrogen peroxide. Mm, that does not feel good. So she's putting it all over Tim. He's screaming, he's yelling. I say, I told you, man. I told you that was bottom of our fence, right? Tim, Tim was just a crazy kid. I mean, he was just, just a crazy guy. I was in the military when I got back from the military in 2002 and he came out here. He was here. He was a DJ on the radio. And Tim is lost. Tim was an alcoholic. He was lost. He was so far from Jesus. And I figured that we were going to connect, right? Because we were boys. And I figured that we were going to connect. And here's the thing. We came back here in March of 2002 and he died in July. And we never connected. The thing here that bothers me the most is not that I lost my friend, but I don't think he knew Jesus. And I struggle with that on a daily basis. I keep asking myself, why didn't I connect with him? Why didn't I go and reach out to him, right? I just believed that our paths would eventually cross, and they never did. And here's the thing. You just don't know. You just don't know. So I want to say to you today is don't hesitate when it comes to sharing Jesus with anybody. Say don't hesitate. Okay. So here we are. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 8. Let me give you some background of what's going on here, or what's happening here. So in the verses before of uh, Acts chapter 8, we see that the gospel of Jesus has reached Samaria, right? Another region, another place. We are, we are told that Peter and John had gone down to Samaria to lay hands on people there to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, the, and, and it's just going nuts. It's going gangbusters. People are giving their life to Jesus, right? Let's look at verse 25. I'm going to put it here on the screen. It says, so this is, this is uh, the apostles. This is Peter. This is John. 
Philip is a part of this. It says, so after they had testified and spoken the word to, of the Lord, they traveled back to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Man, the message of Jesus is getting out because a few are telling them about Christ. Which brings us to verse 26. And it says this, it says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, right? So this is one of the, the apostles that are, that are with Peter and John. And one of the uh, uh, angels of the Lord speak to Philip. And he says this, he says, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There, there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. And the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. Now let's just keep this up here for just a moment. So Philip receives a word from the Lord and gives him specific instructions. He says, get up. And he says, I want you to head south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It is a desert road. Philip is actually having success preaching ministry uh, to the great crowds in Samaria, but he obediently left that ministry to travel on a desert road. You know, sometimes God is going to ask us to do things that don't make sense to us. He's going to ask us to do things that don't make sense to us in that moment. And so we start to question it, don't we? We start to question it, don't we? Yes. Is my microphone not working? Is, is Shelly not working? What's going on? Right? right? So sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense to us in, in a certain moment. And then we start questioning them. Lord, how does this make sense at all? Right? Philip is rocking it in Samaria. He is preaching and people are coming to Jesus left and right and right and left. And he's, he's seeing people giving their lives to Christ and families are being transformed. And what a great experience and how great it must have felt for Philip just to be a part of this. But God says, Philip, I need you to get up. I need you to, to get up and head out, and I, I want you to go down this desert road. So he does it. And what happens as he goes down this desert road? He actually runs into this Ethiopian, this eunuch. Let me give you some background about this. So in ancient times, a eunuch was a person, uh, was a man who was cast, was a castrated man. And it was usually a slave who was used to uh, watch over a treasury. But however, the practice of the eunuch serving a treasure became so common uh, that frequently the title of eunuch was used for the treasurers who were not physically eunuchs. So it may be that the term simply denotes his high position in the queen's administration. So regardless, he had obviously come to believe in God of Israel because he was returning home after worship in Jerusalem. If we look at scripture, if we look in the Bible, we see that there are many times in the Bible where God gives specific instructions to people. Check this out. In Acts chapter 9, verses 9 to 10, right? There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And he said to him in a vision, he said, Ananias, here am I, the Lord, he replied. And listen, what did he say? He said what? Get up, right? Well, didn't the Lord, uh, the angel of the Lord, tell Philip to get up? These guys must be just sitting around doing nothing, right? Because he says, get up, right? So he says, get up, and he says, go to Straight Street, or go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he had prayed there. The, the, uh, the Lord told Ananias, I want you to get up, and I want you to go to Judas's house, that is on Strange Street. I'm giving you the address. Is that specific? Right? He's specifically telling him where to go. Oh, and I want you to go to his house. And there you will find a man from Tarsus. Right? His name is Saul. You're going to find a guy. His name is Saul. He's from Tarsus. He's telling you the man's name. He's telling you where he's from. And there you will find him praying. That is specific. That is detailed. That is detail orientation. 
right? That's you're saying to yourself, this is where the Lord wants you to go. And you're going to find him there. There's more. Luke 22, verses 7 through 13. Then the day of the unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter to John and said, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And they say, Where do you want us to prepare? So the Lord says, Listen. Jesus says, Listen. When you entered the city, now he's getting specific. When you enter the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. I want you to look at this real quick. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. It didn't say you're going into the city and you're going to find a man carrying a jug on, a, on his head. You're going to meet him. He's going to find you. When you walk into the city, you never see a man carrying a water jug. That was the job of the women. So you're going to see specifically a man carrying a water jug, but he'll find you. Check it out. Go to the next one. Then, then he said, when that man finds you, I want you to follow him into the house that he enters. Let me ask you this. If, if you were them, and you said, hey man, there's a guy carrying a water jug. He's coming this way. Don't, look, don't make eye contact. Hey fellas, Come follow me. Would you follow him if Jesus told you to? Stranger danger? So you follow him, and follow him into the house. Okay. Tell the owner of the house. Now you're talking to the owner of the house. Hey, the teacher asks uh, you, where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? If you ask that question to the owner of the house, he will show you a large room and it's furnished. It's furnished, the room is upset. He goes, and I want you to make preparations there. So they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Don't you believe that God is specific? If you don't, let me give you another example. Acts chapter 10, 17 through 20. While Peter was deeply perplexed, about what the vision he had seen might mean right away, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, three men are looking for you. Get up. Get up. Get up. Go downstairs and go with them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. So he gets up. He's not filled with doubt, and he goes out there. Now, if you read on in these verses, and I encourage you to read your Bible, but if you read on, you'll see that Cornelius had a vision about Peter, and that he was to invite Peter to his house. And so he sent his men, Peter went, and Peter shared the good news of Jesus to those in Cornelius' house. So Philip was told to go down a desert road. Go down a desert road. I want you to leave what you're doing. And I want you to go down a desert road. Philip leaves the, the, what he was doing. And he goes down the desert road. And he comes up to this man in a chariot. Now listen. It says that he came up to him. He ran up to him. The chariot is moving. That means Philip has to be moving. He must be a track star, right? Because he's running right next to him, okay? And the Ethiopian man, so, so Philip saw the chariot and he heard two voices. He heard the Ethiopian man as he read from the prophet Isaiah and the Holy Spirit telling him to join that man. And so Philip didn't have to be told twice and he sprung into action and he ran up there. A couple years ago, Maybe, yeah, about yeah, three years ago. Every Monday afternoon, I would meet with some men to pray. Steve, Mark, and Jeremiah. And we always meet, we always met at Steve's house to pray. One o'clock on a Monday. As I'm driving to Steve's house, the Lord says, I want you to go, <laughs> I want you to get up, and I want you to go and prayer walk around the hospital. It didn't make sense. But I said, okay, I showed up and I told the guys, I said, hey, today 
instead of praying here, we need to go pray around the hospital. Of course, they all said, yeah, let's do it. So we get out there and we prayed around the cancer center as well. So Jeremiah and Mark went one way, Steve and I went the other. And we just started praying and we're, walk, we're prayer walking. And it, you just take your time as you go all the way around. As we find, and, we, and we're praying and God is showing some, us some amazing things. We're praying for the, the people in the hospital to be well and to be healed and to experience Christ. And, uh, you know, and we're talking to people as they come by us on, on the road. But as we gathered up, we circled up, there were two nurses where we met, the four of us. There were two nurses that were just standing there. Uh, and this is like during, I think it was like, uh, COVID was kind of almost over-ish. And so these two nurses, they just looked tired. And we knew one of them. And we're like, hey, what's going on? How you doing? And, and so uh, we said, can we pray for you? And they're like, yes, please. So here we are. We all grab hands out in the middle of nowhere. And we just start praying for them. As we're praying for them, I get a phone call. And I don't recognize the number, so I step away. And it's actually uh, an inmate from jail. And so I said hello, and I said, hey, would you accept this call? I'm like, yeah. Well, come to find out this guy uh, knew me, more of like an acquaintance kind of thing. He says, man, I was just thinking about you. I had your number. I, will you pray for me? Uh, I'm really struggling with that. So we put him on speaker. We started praying over him. You see, the Lord told me, Jason, I want you to go to the hospital. I want you to prayer walk out there. He didn't tell me who I was going to meet. He didn't tell me who was going to call me. But what if I didn't know? What if I stayed in Steve's ministry room? What if I didn't do that? Would we have been happy when we had those contacts? A couple weeks ago, you all know that I like to go prayer walk. I like to prayer walk everywhere. And I usually take my faithful companion, Layla. But Layla is getting old now, and she can't walk long distances. So I went by myself without telling her. <laughs> um, and so I went out, and I come to this crossroad. I go this way, it's a short prayer walk. I go this way. I go this way, it's three quarters of a mile. If I go this way, it's three miles. And I stop, and I say, God, where do you want me to go? He says, Jason, I want you to take the three-mile prayer walk. I said, okay. So I went right instead of left, and I'm just praying. And I get onto Pershing, and I'm walking on Pershing, and on Pershing, where we are, they have these radar things, right, that tell you how fast you're going. <clears throat> and I'm just praying. And some of you know that I met a guy in Pershing by the name of Nick. Nick is an old male military guy, body just beat up and just bruised, and we've, I've been witnessing to him forever. And so I, I walk by, I see him, he's walking in, and I was like, hey, good morning. He's like, hey. Right, so I, and I'm just praying, right? And all of a sudden, I'm looking at the uh, the sign, and it's flashing 14. And I'm hearing this like electric thing coming. But I don't turn around, right? I'm just watching it. It's like 14. And then I start thinking, I walk fast, right? Oh, that's 14 miles an hour. That's amazing. I don't, feel, I don't feel tired. I feel great. All of a sudden, Nick's on his scooter, and he's got one of those semi truck air horns on it. And he goes, hey man, I had to catch up to you. Right? He's got Parkinson's now, so he shakes violently. And he says, Do you still preach? Yes. He says, Are you still at that church at L Triple C? I said, Yeah. And he starts shaking. He goes, just give me a minute. And so I lay hands on him, start praying for his healing right there. I said, No, Nick, I'm not gonna give you a minute. I'm gonna pray right now. So I prayed over him and he starts weeping. He says, I want to come to your church. I said, you're more welcome to come to my church. He says, can I drive up there in this thing? I said, I'll pick you up. I mean, you get your little buggy, and we'll load you up in the trailer, strap you down, you ride the trailer, and bring that out. It's kind of good, man. Right? <laughs> and he just says, I just, I just need to experience Jesus more. What if I didn't go for a walk? What if I went left instead of right? You just don't know. Say, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. <laughs> so check this out. Let's look at what Philip did. Verse 30 to 35. So when Philip ran up to it, he runs up to the chariot. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? Understand that Philip is running next to the chariot. Hey, do you understand what you're reading? He knows what he's reading. 
And the eunuch said, the Ethiopian says, how can I? Unless someone guides me. Philip running right next to him, right? And so he said he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. I'm pretty sure Philip got up and said, how long are you going to make me run? That's crazy. I can run 14 miles an hour, but you're running around just kidding, right? And so he, he gets up on there, and uh, so then they, they read the scripture, right? And so what he's reading is Isaiah 53, 7 through 8, which is speaking of the suffering servant of the Lord who would be led like a sheep to the slaughter. So Philip runs up to the chariot, asks him if he understands what he's reading. The Ethiopian says no. He says, get up here in my chariot. And so he jumps in. He starts sharing the good news of Jesus. He just left Samaria telling the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Christ. People come into Christ and everything. And God says, I need you to go down a desert road. What if he didn't go down the desert road? He gets in there and he starts sharing the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, you and I, we, we need to pray regularly for God to bring someone across our path with whom we can share the love of Jesus with, don't we? And I guarantee you, some of you are sitting in here never pray that prayer. You want to know why? Because you're afraid. You want to know why you don't pray that prayer? Because you're like, what if they mock me? What if they, what if they challenge me? <laughs> what are they going to do, right? There are people out there whom the Spirit has already prepared you for. And like this Ethiopian man, they're asking themselves, how can I understand unless someone tells me about it? Listen, believers are to know the Scriptures so that they are prepared to help unbelievers properly understand and respond to the gospel, as well as to help follow believers grow in their faith. A couple weeks ago, last week, last, last week, I was invited to come speak to a group of men at a place called the Harmony House. In fact, Pastor Joe asked me a long time ago, will you come? Yeah, I'll come. And I got to sit there and I got to meet some of the men and these are amazing dudes, man. Amazing men, right? <laughs> Here's the thing. They're my brothers. And I started preaching about things of uh, the power of sin, is what I started preaching about. Was the power of sin and how heavy it is and how, how it weighs us down and how we used to live in a certain way, but now we don't because of the freedom that we have in Christ. And as I'm leading these men, and as we got done, I asked them to pray. And I said, how many of you here have never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're ready to do it now? And two men raised their hands. And they gave their life to Christ. Then Joe had a fire pit out in the, uh, in the back. We were doing s'mores, right? And so we're sitting there doing s'mores, and... These guys know how to roast a marshmallow, man. Right? They know how to do it. I was in awe. And I was like, man, mine's like, you know, you know, zero to 60 burn. That's how it is, right? These guys had like a rotisserie thing going, and, which is amazing, right? But Jeff, Jeff Willoughby, he goes out there and he starts witnessing to some of the dudes uh, around the fire pit that didn't join us for church. And three more guys gave their life to Christ at the fire. So we had a total, of, yeah, 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 that's, that's crazy, that's crazy. So we had a total of five guys in two hours give their life to Jesus. Well, listen, it doesn't stop after that. So after we left, one of the men who gave their life to Christ comes up to Pastor Joe, right? So Pastor Joe is a chaplain over at the VOA. And so Pastor uh, comes up to Pastor Joe and says, listen, can I have a Bible? Well, of course Pastor Joe is going to say yes. If he didn't say no, he and I would fight, right? <laughs> so the thing is, is that, so yeah, he says, man, I got a Bible. Listen to me. I want you to listen. Sometimes all you have to do is show up and Jesus will do the rest. Amen. That's all you have to do. It's as simple as that. Right? Check this out. Listen to what Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says. It says, go. Say go. 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 Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them 
to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the ages. We call this the Great Commission. It says go. It says make disciples. Then baptize them, teach them. And remember this. I am with you through it all. That's what Jesus says. You just need to be willing to tell them about Jesus. Amen? First Peter 3, 13 through 15. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy. Listen to this. Ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. God is not looking for spectators, but players who live for their king with righteousness. So we got to be ready at all times to share about the hope who lives inside of us. Amen? Amen. Say, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Verses 36 through 40. We'll close it out here. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water, right? So Philip is in the chariot. He's witnessing to Jesus. This guy is already a believer because he went to Jerusalem to worship. And here he is as they're traveling down the road. They came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop. I'm pretty sure Philip said absolutely nothing. So he ordered the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. What an amazing day, right? Some dude comes running up next to my chariot with all my horses, and he says, Hey, do you understand what you're reading? Oh, I have no idea what I'm reading. Get up in here. Now, you know that the eunuch in the back of his mind, he has to be, because if you are the guy in the chariot, wouldn't you be wondering, where did this guy come from? Why is he all running up on my chariot? Right? If someone was to come running up on your car, what would you do? Roll him up, lock him down, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you do that? Some of you are just like, I don't know what I would do. Freeze. I would run the red light. I wouldn't stop, right? What would you do? <laughs> I would roll the window up like this and say, What do you want? My eyes moving back and forth. Don't be shady, dude. <laughs> right? What would you do, right? But he invites him in. Can you imagine that? Pulling up next to someone and someone told the sign and says, hey, I'll tell you all about Jesus. Would you allow that guy in your car? The eunuch did, right? And so Philip gets in there, tells him about Jesus. They get baptized, right? So listen, oh, what an amazing day. What an amazing event. What if Philip said, God, I don't want to go down the desert road. There's no water. I'm thirsty. <laughs> I'm enjoying I'm enjoying telling everybody about you and in your Samaria. It's so good. So good. But your kingdom is expanding. Right? I mean, you're in the middle of it. Right? It's amazing. It's like you're leaving the best party ever just to go be alone on a desert road. Who wants to do that? Sign me up, Philip. I'm, I'm the guy. He goes down there, right? Baptize the dude. <clears throat> what a great thing, right? One more to heaven. Let's go. Because he said, go down the desert road. Jesus is not going to mislead you. Jesus is not going to misguide you. Jesus is not going to say, well, this is a really play a prank on him right now, right? He's not going to do that. He says, go down the straight street. Walk into Judas's house. There is a man from Tarsus who made his soul, and you will find him praying. I want you to lay hands on him. Oh, by the way, he's the one who's been murdering all you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's freaky stuff. <laughs> right? And Jesus says, go do it. And he says, don't worry about it. I got your back. Then you roll the windows down in your car, unlock the door, open the door, and say, Jesus, got my back. Get in the back. <laughs> right? Get in the back, shut the door, put your seatbelt on, because this car don't ride until the seatbelt's on. <laughs> you want some water? Let's go. Let's ride. Let's roll. Right? That's what Philip is doing. That's what this eunuch is doing. <laughs> right? So they come out. <clears throat> they come out of the water. They come out of the water. Then the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That's freaky. 
Right? Comes out of the water, Philip is gone. Can you imagine what the eunuch, the Ethiopian's thinking now? Wait a minute, the dude just got in my chariot. We, he baptized me. We come out we're like, yeah, and now he's gone. Yeah. Where did he go? Yeah. This is true story. This is what's happening. Right? So they don't see him any longer. But what does the eunuch do? He went on his way, and what was he doing? Come on, what was he doing? I'm gonna He's rejoicing, he's celebrating. Philip appears in this other town. <laughs> and as he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea, Jesus says, I know you're partying in Samaria. I'm going to put you in a desert road, and one more is going to come to, to know me, and then I'm going to put you in another town. And you're going to sweep it all up, and everybody's going to come to know me because of you. Because of you. Check this out, Romans 6, 1 through 7. The Ethiopian gives his life to Christ. And listen to what Romans 1, 6, or 6, 1 through 7 says. What should we say then? Should we continue on, or should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can, we, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. That's why the Ethiopian was rejoicing, because he was walking in the newness of life. For we have been reunited with him in the likeness of his death. We will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self, say old self. Old self. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is free from sin. The Ethiopian's old life is buried in baptism and came out of the water in freedom of Christ. <coughs> and when you, when we come out of, when they come out of the water, you know, Philip's taken away. Right? And the Ethiopian continues to, to go on and rejoice. A couple years ago, the church had church out of Kirk Valley. And we baptize in the lake there. And the Lord says, Jason, I want you to be baptized out there in that lake. I said, wait. The Lord, I was baptized at the age of seven. I don't need to be baptized again. I understand what it all means. I, I understand all that stuff. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. You see, because in April of 2018, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and I need you to be baptized again in the water. Who am I to argue with the Lord? I said, okay. Right? Then the devil comes in, right? Every time that you're obedient to the Lord, doesn't the devil come in and he's got to put in his two strong sense? Right? So he comes in to the Lord where the devil starts talking to me. He says, Jason, you're a pastor of a church. What are people going to say when they see you get into the baptism water? What are they going to say about you? I said, get away from me, man. You're such a liar. That's who you are. Amen. I got baptized. Now listen, it's not just because of what I did. I was being faithful and obedient to the Lord. The Lord asked me to get in the water. Yes, sir. Right? That's how it works with the Lord. When the Lord tells you to do something, it is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not, why do you want me to do that? Right? He said, I want you to get up and go down the desert road. I want you to get up and go get baptized in that, in that lake. Okay. I get baptized in that lake. At the end of the time of baptism, seven people got baptized. They just walked into the water, jeans and all. <laughs> they did. They just walked in, and I was like, you better empty your pockets. Those phones are probably going to be done. Right? But they got in. We had a husband and wife come in and get baptized together at the same time. Yep. People are, I'm telling you, it, it, it's crazy. They're just like, they're stripping down. Let's get into the water. They couldn't get into the water fast enough. When it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to sharing the good news, when it comes to sharing Jesus, all you have to do, listen to me, is so easy. All you have to do is share your story. 
And then you tell them all about how Jesus saved your life. And don't be afraid. And don't be ashamed to share the gospel with anybody. That person that came across your mind, family member, friend, someone from the past. <coughs> don't be afraid to share the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew and also the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. Listen. I believe that we don't have a lot of time left. Yeah. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And you can sit here and you can say, oh, I heard that growing up that Jesus is coming soon. The Bible tells us that Jesus says, I'm coming soon. <laughs> Maybe some of you have a tin in your life. Maybe you think you have some time. And all I'm going to ask you to do is to invite the people you know to come with you to church. We put all these chairs out for you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what I saw when I saw these chairs this morning? I saw the future. Amen. Amen. And Trudy and I can't do this by ourselves. It's time to invite that family member. It's time to invite that friend. It's time to reach out to that person in the past that came across your mind. Tell them about Jesus. And then bring them to church. And I guarantee you, you'll see lives being changed by the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus. The question is this. <clears throat> What's holding you back? What's stopping you from doing it? I say, <coughs> don't hesitate. <coughs> say, don't hesitate. Don't, don't hesitate. hesitate.